John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave While weep the sons of bondage whom he ventured all to save But though he sleeps his life was lost while struggling for the slave His soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah Glory, glory, hallelujah Welcome to War of the Rebellion Stories of the Civil War. I am your host, Leon, and this is a reading of the regimental history under the Maltese Cross, Antietam to Appomattox, the Loyal Uprising in Western Pennsylvania. 1861 to 1865, Campaign's 155th Pennsylvania Regiment, narrated by the rank and file. Chapter 16 Five Forks Appomattox. Engagement of Lewis Farm, or Quaker Road. Gallantry of Colonel Pearson. Burying the Dead. Furious Attack of Confederates on Fifth Corps. Plan of Battle of Five Forks. Sheridan orders plan to be put into execution. Brilliant Charge of Fifth Corps. Gallantry of Major George M. Loughlin of Griffin's staff. Warren's removal from command of 5th Corps. Griffin succeeds Warren. April 6th, General Meade resumes control of 5th Corps. 155th under command of Major Klein. Regiment deployed as skirmishers in advance of brigade. Flag of truce. Grant's letter to Lee proposing surrender. Lee's letter accepting terms. 155th among regiments designated to receive surrender. Confederate Army stacks arms in front of 155th and 3rd Brigade. The war over. Parole of General Lee and staff. Casualties. March 29th, 1865. This morning at daylight, the 155th marched out of its camp with the other regiments of the 5th Corps to initiate a new campaign, which proved to be the beginning of the end. No shelter except the canopy of the heavens was to cover them until the last armed foe of the glorious Stars and Stripes had grounded his arms. General Lee, with the knowledge that General Warren, who, with his invincible troops, had gradually wrestled from him his strongest positions, was now massed on the left near the Southside Railroad, Lee's last real artery, ready to strike for that coveted prize either by force or by strategy, must have considered his position extremely critical. To a man of weaker nerve and less fruitful of resource than Lee, the situation would have certainly seemed desperate. There was, however, still a network of strong defense to be overcome by Warren before Lee's hold on this important railroad was loosened. The latter, realizing this, immediately stripped his long lines of fortifications around Richmond and Petersburg of troops, leaving but a skirmish line to guard them, and concentrated the main body of his army near the threatened points to meet General Warren with his troops in the advance, and Sheridan with his cavalry still farther to the left. The left of the Confederate main line of entrenchments, beginning northwest of Richmond, which had never yet been broken, extended from Petersburg in a southwestward direction to Hatcher's Run, at the point where the Boyden Plank Road crosses that stream. Thence, on the south side, of and parallel with the stream, some distance westward, to the White Oak Road, 35 miles in length, this line of entrenchments protected Lee's right and rear, but about four miles farther west from the termination of this main line on the White Oak Road, a detached line of entrenchments existed, running parallel with the White Oak Road to cover an important strategic point known as Five Forks. To reach the Southside Railroad in this roundabout way, it was necessary that General Warren should either circumvent or successfully assault these fortifications. It was evidently Grant's plan to use both methods of reaching the coveted prize— Sheridan with his cavalry to endeavor the flank of the strong positions, while Warren's columns kept the enemy troops so fully employed that they could not be used against Sheridan. 
to the latter commander must be given the credit of organizing the general plan of this campaign but to warren belongs the glory of successfully carrying the details into effect at an early hour of march twenty ninth eighteen sixty five the one hundred and fifty fifth together with warren's whole corps marched southwest to rowanti creek at the point where the quaker road crosses that stream thence north along that wagon road to a point where it crosses gravelly run the southern branch of rowanti creek the battle of lewis farm shortly after crossing gravelly run on the quaker road the first brigade of griffin's division came into contact with the enemy in advance of their breastworks on hatcher's run and a severe engagement ensued the confederate pickets unable to check the advance of the union troops rapidly fell back to their main line of battle here a determined stand being made the first brigade was compelled to retreat in confusion the 155th being nearest the scene of action was promptly sent on the double quick to the support of the discomfited first brigade arriving on the ground no organized union troops were to be seen by the regiment one of griffin's batteries however was holding its ground on a ridge a few rods in advance without taking time to form in line of battle the 155th pushed on hastily and formed in the rear of the battery where the enemy's column was seen advancing on the double quick to capture the guns the battery boys maintained their position bravely and the rapidity with which they loaded and fired canister into the exultant enemy was surprising the appearance of the 155th so suddenly in the rear of the battery in support was like an apparition to the foe and after a few volleys had been poured into their column by the regiment the confederates quickly retreated dashing exploit of general pearson death of lieutenant strong a short distance in front and to the left of the position occupied by the battery was a long sawdust pile behind which unknown to the 155th a large number of the confederates were concealed general pearson commanding the regiment who in some way became aware of the presence of this hidden force rode up to the color sergeant and reached for the regimental colors which color sergeant marlin refused to yield saying quote, show me where you wish the colors carried and i'll take them there unquote. general pearson however seized the colors and shouting quote, follow me men or lose your colors unquote. galloped furiously up on the sawdust pile the regiment following cheering lustily the enemy immediately took to their heels leaving fifty or sixty prisoners in the hands of the 155th this gallant act of general pearson was on recommendation of general charles griffin rewarded by a brevet major generalship lieutenant james strong of company i a gallant and faithful officer was shot through the head and instantly killed in this action following close to general pearson as he planted the colors on the enemy's position as lieutenant strong lay on the field mortally wounded corporal charles a walters left the ranks to relieve his sufferings with true soldierly instinct lieutenant strong bade the corporal to spare his efforts as his case was hopeless and to return to the ranks of his company lieutenant strong left a wife and six children in a little cottage by the coal works on the yakagani where he had been employed to mourn his death after this short battle the regiment spent an hour or longer and succoring the wounded and burying the dead from their own ranks as well as looking after the wounded of the brave members of the battery which had so gallantly held its ground until reinforced by the 155th several men were detailed with picks and shovels to dig a trench fifteen or twenty feet long six feet or seven feet wide and three feet deep over the bottom of these trenches were carefully spread blankets taken from the knapsacks of the dead men the bodies were then tenderly laid side by side and covered with the blankets the trenches were then filled up where the identity of a dead comrade through any letters or other documents with his person where the identity of a dead comrade through any letters or other documents about his person could be ascertained his name with his company and regiment were written or carved upon a stick or a piece of board which was driven into the ground at the head of his position in the trench an incident of heroism and devotion to duty occurred in this action and is worthy of notice 
in the impetuous rush of the 155th to the sport of Griffin's Battery, in this action, in the midst of the rain of missiles that were raising dust spots in the ground over which the regiment was double-quicking, a soldier of the 1st Brigade, which had become disorganized and scattered, unable to find his own command, voluntarily joined the ranks of the 155th and was thus going into battle among entire strangers. Early in the action, this visiting comrade received a mortal wound and toppled over. Thus died in battle an unknown patriot. This brief engagement is known in history as the Battle of the Quaker Road, or Lewis Farm. Later the same evening, the 155th advanced a mile, and putting out a strong picket line, bivouacked for the night. At the apex of an angle in the road, where a squad of the regiment's pickets were posted, a Confederate captain was noticed approaching, evidently reconnoitering. Unaware of the vicinity of the pickets, the officer approached within a few yards of the post. On discovering, which he demanded the surrender of Sergeant D.R. Curl of Company H and Lieutenant D. Porter Marshall of Company K, they refused and in turn captured the daring Confederate officer. This movement of the Fifth Corps along the Quaker Road was supported on the right flank of the Second Corps, commanded by General Humphreys, the latter advancing by the Vaughan Road, intending to strike the enemy's works at Hatcher's Run at the point where the road crossed the stream, about four miles to the right of Warren. Thus, both corps were marching north towards Hatcher's Run on parallel roads. Griffin's division of the 5th Corps, including the 155th, was the first to come into contact with the enemy at Quaker Road, or Lewis Farm, which action has already been described. The point where this engagement occurred was less than two miles from the enemy's main line on Hatcher's Run. The division pressed on, forcing the Confederates into their works. Sheridan's cavalry, by a more circuitous route, had by this time reached Dinwiddie Courthouse, about six miles southwest of the position occupied by the 155th and Griffin's division on the Quaker Road. The Second Corps, under Humphreys, marching north on the Vaughan Road, encountering many obstructions, had not yet reached the enemy's front on Hatcher's Run, when night set in. To resist this advance of the Union Army, General Lee had 20,000 muskets and a few brigades of cavalry in position. Protected by a series of the strongest fortifications parallel with Hatcher's Run, as previously described, that modern military science could devise. The night of the 29th of March was exceedingly stormy and wet, but on the morning of the 30th the rain had ceased, and the 155th, with other troops, were up and in position ready to strike. The ground, however, was so soaked with rain as to become almost a swamp, and the roads were impassable for artillery trains. Military operations were well nigh at a standstill. The firing along the outposts was continuous. The Second Corps extended its left and made connection with the Fifth Corps. It became a serious question to the Union Army of getting up supplies of subsistence and ammunition. The wounded could not be carried back to the railroad and had to be made as comfortable as possible in the woods, with a limited number of tents available for shelter. Grant's army at this point could neither advance nor retreat. Warren, however, pressed his troops close up to the Confederate works on the White Oak Road to keep the enemy occupying them from sending reinforcements to the troops opposing Sheridan, who had advanced to assault the enemy's works at Five Forks. The Confederates having superior numbers, however, easily repulsed the cavalry and drove Sheridan's troopers back to Dimwitty Courthouse. Early on in the morning of March the 31st, the 155th and other regiments of Griffin's division extended their lines gradually still further to the left, endeavoring to connect with Sheridan and reach the right flank of the enemy's line so as to overlap it and get in their rear. The stormy weather and bad roads which had impeded the progress of Warren's troops had been of immense advantage to Lee, giving him an opportunity to reinforce his works at Five Forks, which was threatened by Sheridan's cavalry, and Lee had all of his troops now forward and in position to reinforce any part of his long lines on Hatcher's Run, which might become hard-pressed. Every hour's delay, however, meant increased peril to the enemy. Brave and full of resources to the last, General Lee resolved to repeat the tactics which he had used so successfully against the Union forces in the wilderness, 
and by which he had so often foiled Grant's flanking movements. This was to launch strong bodies of his troops, with the fury of a thunderbolt upon the flanks of Warren's troops while they were engaged in changing position, and unprepared to resist a sudden attack. Battle of Gravelly Run In the movement westward on March the 31st, Ayers and Crawford's division of Warren's corps marched by way of Boyden Plank Road with Griffin's division, including the 155th in the rear, in what is known in military terms as an Eculon. Extremely anxious to reach the flank of the enemy's position and connect with Sheridan, General Warren obtained permission from General Meade to make a reconnaissance in the evening and, if he found it possible, to take position on the flank of the enemy's works. It was this reconnoitering movement that had precipitated the conflict. The advance had scarcely began when Lee, believing the opportunity for which he was watching had arrived, with the swiftness of lightning, hurled his veterans like an avalanche upon Ayer's division, which, stunned by the blow, fell back upon Crawford's division in turn. Confused by the mass of fugitives rushing upon them from Ayer's division, broke their lines and fell back upon Griffin's division and the 155th. The enemy, flushed with victory, charged upon Griffin's division, but were repulsed and sent staggering backwards. Then, while the two former divisions were rallying and reforming their lines, Griffin's division, including the 155th, charged upon the enemy, driving part of them back in a mob over their entrenchments, and the remainder disappeared down White Oak Road towards Five Forks. Before the enemy could regain their entrenchments, a large number of prisoners were left in the hands of Griffin's division. Although Lee had failed in his attack on Warren, he was quickly ready for another bold and determined effort. Privates Edward R. Melkor of Company E and Alexander Eaton of Company H were killed in this action. Among the wounded were Corporal John Saber of Company B, Privates James Martin, Company D, Henry Starr and William H. Stitt of Company G, and Martin V.B. Spruill of Company K. Bad news flies fast. An exaggerated report of the disaster to the Fifth Corps, without information as to the glorious recoup, led General Grant in issuing orders to the Fifth Corps to move to the assistance of General Sheridan that night, to authorize General Sheridan to relieve General Warren from the command of the Fifth Corps in case Warren failed him. That evening, General Warren was directed to withdraw from the White Oak Road, being relieved by the Second Corps, and to advance by crossing Gravelly Run and to make connection with General Sheridan. It was a slow, hard, all-night's march. Bridges had to be built crossing the swollen Gravelly Run, and many places through the impassable swamp had to be corduroyed. The troops toiled all night and began to arrive at Sheridan's position soon after daylight, the rear of the Fifth Corps not arriving until noon, April 1st, 1865. Battle of Five Forks Meantime, Sheridan had been making his dispositions to attack as soon as the troops of the Fifth Corps were available. General Custer's division of cavalry were brought up and placed in position. The enemy occupied a line of entrenchments in front of the White Oak Road covering the road to Ford Station, which, leading southward in two branches at its intersection with the White Oak Road, constituted the Five Forks. General Sheridan deployed his dismounted cavalry in front of the enemy's works. With a scabbard, he sketched for General Warren the location of the enemy's entrenchments on the White Oak Road, and directed Warren to advance across the White Oak Road past the enemy's flank, then to change direction to the west and advance rapidly, taking the enemy in flank and rear, which would be a signal for advance by the cavalry. Warren immediately sketched a plan of attack, copies of which he furnished to his division commanders. After the orders had been given by General Warren, the troops of the 5th Corps marched two to three miles and were in position for attack by 4 p.m., April 1st, near the White Oak Church. The attack was immediately made, advancing across the White Oak Road. Ayers on the left and Crawford's division on the right, in line by brigades. Griffin's division in reserve was in line by brigades in rear of Crawford's division. Firing began at the White Oak Road. General Sheridan who rode with General Ayers, was chafing with impatience. The moment General Ayers' strong skirmish line met the enemy, 
Sheridan put spurs to his horse and dashed along in front of the battle lines, shouting encouragement to the troops. As the lines moved forward, a man on the skirmish line was struck in the neck, crying as he fell to the ground, quote, I'm killed, unquote. You're not hurt a bit, shouted Sheridan. Pick up your gun, man, and move on the front. The poor fellow grasped his musket, sprang to his feet, and rushed forward a short distance, then fell dead. It was found that the enemy's line did not extend as far eastward as General Sheridan had been led to believe by his scouts, but was covered on the left by a skirmish line of Munford's dismounted Confederate cavalry in deploy. General Sheridan's impetuously ordered an immediate change of direction by General Ayer's left brigade under command of General Fred Winthrop, and an attack on the flank of the enemy's line. This broke the connection of Winthrop's brigade with the rest of Ayer's command. Winthrop gallantly attacked, and after driving the enemy a short distance, was himself attacked in flank and driven back with serious loss, the gallant General Winthrop himself being killed at the head of his brigade. General Ayers and General Sheridan rapidly brought the other two brigades of Ayers to the assistance of Winthrop's brigade, and then ensued some very sturdy fighting. In the meantime, General Crawford, having lost touch with the division on his left to the sudden withdrawal of Ayers' troops, was advancing rapidly northward, driving the dismounted Confederate cavalry before him through the woods. General Warren's aides, having failed to get Crawford to change direction and follow Ayers, General Warren went after him in person, in the meantime sending orders to Griffin to change direction and move into the gap between Ayers and Crawford. This, Griffin did handsomely, but there was much very difficult ground to be covered, and it took time, while Ayers and the cavalry were fighting hard. During the wheeling movement of the 5th Corps, many troops of the three divisions, becoming confused, lost their commands, and were intermingled in the rear. General Chamberlain, commanding the 1st Brigade of Griffin's division, who was among these troops, endeavoring to reduce them to a semblance of order, was most ably assisted by Captain George M. Loughlin, formerly Captain of Company E of the 155th, but now on General Griffin's staff. General Chamberlain states that Captain Loughlin went dashing in among the disorganized body of troops in this action, and by his gallantry and cool courage in this trying emergency succeeded in rallying the men, inspiring them with such confidence that they followed him enthusiastically into the hottest part of the engagement. It was no doubt this clearness of mind and self-command of Captain Lawlin in times of urgent need and severe strain that led General Griffin to call the captain to a distinguished position on his staff, an honor which the 155th highly appreciated. General Ayer's division on the left, which had fallen back a short distance, quickly rallied, and charging on the flank of the enemy's entrenchments, ran over them, capturing over 1,000 prisoners. Griffin's division, with the 155th rushing through the gap, fell upon the works in their front, capturing 1,500 prisoners. Crawford's division, which General Warren had gone after, had brought up on the right, fell upon the rear of the enemy, capturing four guns and many prisoners. The Union cavalry was now in front of the Confederate works, and Crawford's division of troops concentrated at right angles with the White Oak Road. At this point Crawford experienced a most stubborn resistance. The troops in the turmoil, becoming somewhat disorganized, had halted without orders. It was a most critical period. General Warren, seizing the corps colors and spurring his horse to the front, called on Crawford's men to follow him. The effect was electrical. There was a wild rush, irrespective of organization, and a large part of the enemy that remained were captured. General Warren's horse was shot under him, and but for the timely interference of Colonel Richardson of the 7th Michigan, Warren might have been killed. In his efforts to shield his beloved commander, Colonel Richardson was himself mortally wounded. The few of the enemy that escaped were pursued by Warren's troops in squads till night, and many of the exhausted fugitives surrendered. Thus ended the Battle of Five Forks, one of the most brilliant and certainly the most decisive battle of the war. General Sheridan suggested the general plan of attack, but it was Warren with the Fifth Corps who arranged the details and fought and won the battle, it being mainly a battle between the infantry of both armies. The trophies left in position of General Warren's troops were many guns and battle flags and more than 5,000 prisoners.
Incidents of the Five Forks Campaign In this engagement and rout of the enemy from their last stronghold, the 155th captured a prisoner for every man in the regiment, three guns and a number of wagons and ambulances. Among the brigades suffering most severely in the fight immediately under Warren, on the right was the command led by Brigadier General Richard Kutler, whose conspicuous gallantry and all the battles of the Army of the Potomac, from the first bull run to Five Forks, had earned for him not only well-deserved promotion, but also the title of, quote, Fighting Dick, unquote, in an epithet which he cordially despised. His command suffered the heaviest in casualties of any brigade in the action of Five Forks. General George A. Custer, commanding a division of cavalry, also serving on the right at Five Forks, was credited in General Warren's official report with the most conspicuous services in the final attack, defeat, and pursuit of the Confederates in their last stand and assault upon Crawford's division at Five Forks. Warren's report, also detailing the number of battle flags and prisoners, captured by Custer's cavalry on the same part of the battlefield on which they charged the enemy. The losses of Crawford's division led by Warren in person exceeded considerably the losses of the other two divisions of the 5th Corps combined. Among the many officers killed in this brilliant and successful assault on the Confederate works at Five Forks, as already stated, was Brigadier General Frederick Winthrop of New York commanding the 1st Brigade, 2nd Division, 5th Corps. While leading the charge at the head of his troops, this distinguished young officer in his 27th year was mortally wounded by a shot through the lungs. He survived his wound scarcely two hours, and when told that the assault had been completely successful, exclaimed, quote, Thank God, I am now willing to die. Unquote. All right. We're going to go ahead and stop right there with an absolutely monstrously cool quote. All right. Before I get into my show notes, I quickly want to talk to you about all of the additional work that I've been doing so that you have a clear understanding of everything. Because now I've got like so many different things going on. I'm going to talk about this because I spent a ton of work getting it all together. I have a finished YouTube channel, which is going to be linked in the show notes, but also on my website. It's War of the Rebellion on YouTube. I have been working really hard on it. I've got gameplay videos with my regiment in the game War of Rights. I think some of you are really going to enjoy that. Although be aware I'm playing in public matches so anyone can talk. So warning, there is sometimes language that is not suitable for young children. But my YouTube channel is not for children. Just be aware of that. But they are very entertaining videos. I do have a music playlist so that you can check out the music either that I've done, that I've contracted someone to do. Uh, someone asked me about Faded Coat of Blue, so I added that up there along with its citations because it is from the Library of Congress. So please... Subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's also got some of the works that are done by, I think I've talked about this before, Colonel Edward Allen, with a short story about his Indian password from an old newspaper clipping that I found online while I was just incidentally looking around for him, and also uh, his Civil War prose on slavery, which is an excellent work, although that's about a half hour long. First one's about five minutes long. I'm also going to be putting up some of the other works that he's done as well from the University of Pittsburgh. Please check them out. His work is amazingly beautiful, and it is one of the best, best things that I've gotten to find to work on and to record. And I'm doing all of his work. He's getting his own playlist because he's got some beautiful poetry. Now, separately from that, I'm going to have an entire playlist just for Union Soldier poetry. And I've been doing some recording videos with the War of Rights video game. And I'm going to superimpose the poetry over the top of that game. Because it's so beautiful 
that unless I'm going to go to a giant military encampment, this is the best way to do it. So that's all those poetry videos are going to be going up this next week. So please come check them out. It's good. It's really cool. Check out my YouTube channel and subscribe to it, please. I also have my Facebook page fully fleshed out as well. So if you're on Facebook, like it, comment, share it. I would appreciate it. It took a really long time. I also have a Twitter account, which is also linked. But if you want to directly talk to me, it's not going to be on Facebook. It's not going to be on Twitter. It's going to be through my Discord, my Discord only. And that Discord is officially open. Like I finally built all of the channels and everything that I want it to look like. And anyone can join. If you've never heard of Discord, think of it as like a group chat with different rooms. And you can also stream in there. It's kind of like having a self-contained chat house with multiple rooms to do different things in it. So if we're going to be doing movie nights, you can watch it. I can stream it. I can stream a movie. You can watch it on your phone with us while we're chatting and talking about whatever movie we're watching. It's more fun than it sounds, I promise you. And if you just want a place to hang out and talk about the Civil War, come to the Discord. Or if you have a really rough day at work and you just want to talk to people about something else, I've got a separate room for that. If you have any problems at all with like downloading it, there's I'll link a YouTube video that will show you how to join Discord so that you can see what it looks like. It's it's where my community is going to be, or at least where I want it to be. So following that, tied to the Discord, but not something that you have to join, is my Patreon. And my Patreon is fully open. It has all the different tiers that give you different roles on Discord. And that goes from volunteer infantry to colonels. And of course, that's also gonna be in the show notes along with everything else. This is going to be one really long show note this time. The Patreon has multiple tiers. And if you just want the two extra episodes every two weeks, or a episode, two episodes a month, uh, it's just $1. But there's escalating rewards that happen after that. So for $1, you get two extra episodes. And, of course, access to the Discord where you get a special role, which means you have a special chat room just for your little community of uh, Patreon subscribers. Beyond that, uh, there's exclusive voice and chat channels for the enlisted, the officers and the senior officers. And of course, if you're not part of Patreon, you can still join the Discord. I just want to be really clear with that. So there's still a community for people who can come hang out with us. Other rewards include the ability to vote on polls for future work. And I've got a huge list of additional histories that I'm going to read. And then you'll be able to vote on which ones are read next. And not all of them are this long. This history is a real rarity at being this long. It's not always like that. So some of them are just like 200 pages or less. You can also receive an executive producer credit on videos and podcast episodes. Right now, that's one person. Thank you, Douglas W., for your continued support. I greatly appreciate it because you have stuck with me when none of this was around and it means a lot to me that you believe in me. So thank you. Other benefits include being able to receive a sticker with the War of the Rebellion logo to show everyone that you support me and a coffee mug and even a sweatshirt depending upon what tier that you're in. So pretty cool looking merch. It's up to you whether you want it or not. It doesn't hurt my feelings. But there's some other additional rewards and stuff that you get. Like if you're in the senior officer tier, you just get to hang out with me. <laughs> like it's because you're an executive producer at that point. And as far as filling up the Patreon, like putting posts there and content and everything else, that starts next week. So come join because if you're a patron, you'll have priority of either playing games with me or uh, hanging out on movie nights and other really cool stuff, like just being able to talk about where we want to take the podcast next, right? If you're a producer, I want you to help. And the producer status starts at $5. So think about it. But once again, you don't have to pay to join the Discord. That's okay. 
especially if you want to come play War of Rights with me. I'm down to sit around in a campfire in a union camp. Some of you may have been to my YouTube channel already and saw the video that I posted, which actually shows what a union camp looks like in that game, which is titled Picket Duty in Maryland on a Stormy Night. That's Those are real graphics in the game, and I only uploaded that in 1080p, not 4K, which is actually what I play the game in. And I hadn't thought about this, but I got an email. John, first of all, I want to say thank you for your donation. He did not want to join my Patreon. He wanted to send me a donation through PayPal, which is not something I had even thought about, but I set it up. So thank you for your donation. You were my first donation ever, so I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. And for everyone else, if you want to buy me a coffee or help me pay for server fees and expenses, because this whole project costs money, um, more than I thought it was going to, but I'm sticking with it because it's worth it. So here is the entire list of all of the projects that I have worked on. My PayPal, my Patreon, the podcast itself, the, my Discord, my website, and my Twitter account, and my Facebook page. All of those are done. Don't have to work on them anymore. This is it. <laughs> Just moving forward. I'm going to post all of these under everything related to this episode. So if you see it on Facebook or on my website or what have you, or in the show notes, it's going to have a link to all of these so you can go visit them. So officially done building the systems of the podcast. And now that I'm done with that, it's time to just hang out and make episodes. It's been a long time coming. I've really looked forward to this and I'm really happy that I'm done. All right. On to our show notes. So in regards to the actual battle of five forks, I'm going to link on my website to people way smarter than me from the Battlefield Trust, of course, who explain it from a bird's eye view. And I'll also include the smaller engagements as we come across them. All right. The 155th showing up at the last minute to back up that battery at the Battle of Quaker Road, Lewis Farm, as it's called today. Luckily for us, the American Battlefield Trust has a beautiful video that shows you the actual ground of that battle. And although the narrator says the battle's not all that of a big deal, it sounds like to the boys of the 155th, it most certainly was. And I think most hilariously to me, General Pearson trying to take the colors from Color Sergeant Martin... And then probably having to pull rank to do it because he wouldn't give it to him is so hilarious. And then having the men chase after those colors, what a way to make a charge. And no offense to reenactors, because I love what you do, because it always looks cool. But that kind of inspiration is not something that you see in reenactments. Maybe I'm wrong. But there's kind of like the safety aspect to it and not really... Like the blood pumping danger that comes with it. But you do see it in games like War of Rights. And I have a YouTube video that's called Daz Inspires the Troops to Victory, which is way more silly, obviously, because it's in a video game rather than that. But it just tickled me pink just to think about it. Also, everyone drink, take a drink for Lieutenant Strong and everyone who died in that battle. Because it sounds like they really fought hard to make it happen, to make it a win. Separately of that, take a drink for the unknown patriot who died fighting alongside the 155th. Hope he was recovered. And when I say take a drink, that means just drink whatever you have. I have coffee right now. So if you've got water, drink water. If you've got whiskey, drink whiskey. If you've got your coffee, drink your coffee. Do whatever. For the battle of Gravelly Run, hail the victorious dead, my friends. And for the battle of Five Forks, I'm going to include another video because... I could talk about it, but I am not as good as actually having someone who knows all about the battle talk about it. So I'm going to include things for you to watch on the website, of course, the Facebook and everything else, so that you can check that out. Battlefield Trust, of course. General Winthrop, being only 27 years old, let's take a drink for him, too. That's, that's incredibly young to be a general. What a quote. Now I am willing to die. Man. So that that's the end of my notes is really just, 
you know, them talking about what the regiment was doing in these battles. So I'm just going to link specific stuff to the battles. Kind of the really m interesting stuff that I really want to talk about is coming later in this chapter. So it's going to be really exciting. All right, everyone. Have a great weekend. Stay safe. Please check out my little content empire I'm building. It is so much work. <laughs> and I've got more coming next week. I didn't get the Patreon episode out last week, so it's going to be released tomorrow. And that has everything to do with all of this additional work and a personal tragedy that happened. It just became more focused on. And then after that, it all kicks off next week. So, and the next episode that comes out next week, Patreon only. So, bye, right, my friends. Have a fantastic weekend. Old John Take Brown's care of body lies a moldering in the episode. grave while weep the sons of bondage whom he ventured all to save. But though he sleeps, his life was lost while struggling for the slave. His soul is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Hallelujah, for his soul is marching on. John Brown was a hero, undaunted, true, and brave. And Kansas knew his valor when he fought her rights to save. And now, though the grass grows green above his grave, his soul is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. For his soul. Marching on He captured Harper's Ferry With us nineteen men so few And frightened old Virginie Till she trembled through and through They hung him for a traitor Themselves a traitorous crew But a soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah Glory, glory, hallelujah Glory, glory, hallelujah For his soul is marching on John Brown was John the Baptist of the Christ we are to see. Christ who of the bondmen shall the liberator be. And soon throughout the sunny south the slaves shall all be free. For his soul is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. That he heralded, he looked from heaven to view On the army of the Union With its flag red, white, and blue And heaven shall sing with anthems Or the deed they mean to do For his soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah Sure.
words of freedom Then strike while strike ye may The death blow of oppression In a better time and way The dawn of old John Brown Has brightened in the day And his soul is marching on 